I'd like to invite you to stand, if you will, and if you're able, as we begin our service this morning with a call to worship, and uh, then we'll remain standing to sing, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the, and the Word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen His glory. Let's sing together. <clears throat> from the Acts of the Apostles in the ninth chapter. I read too long in Sunday school. Let me make sure I get it right. <laughs> Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you're to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision that a man named Ananias will come in and lay hands upon him that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and that he, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, 
For he's an instrument whom I've chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before people of Israel. I myself will show him how, he, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales from his eye fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples of Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In the United Methodist Church, we invite all to come to communion. We consider that to be called an open table. And if you go back, Johnny, because I'm going to need to read that. Uh, the only thing you need to do is answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us through joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you're able, would you stand now as we sing, Lord, I want to be a Christian, and then we'll hear the gospel. We'll remain standing. John in the 21st chapter. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon and Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We'll go with you. 
They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were able to haul it in. Now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciple came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon and Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. <laughs> So I entitled this message today, Fish, Love, and Follow. I'm always amazed when I read this. Of course, it says different things in different transitions, translations. But as you, as you read through this, that you get a picture that the disciples are bewildered. Jesus has been uh, demonstrated himself to them two times. They know he is back, if you will. But they really are not understanding. And so... Peter, the way Peter always does, he's sort of impetuous. He says, I'm going fishing. And the rest of the disciples say, well, I'll go too. And they go out and they don't catch any fish. And then Jesus appears on the shore. If we believe that the beloved disciple is John, John then says to Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter puts some clothes on because he was naked, according to the scripture, gets in the water. It seems reversed to me, but anyway, he gets in the water and he goes to where Jesus is and Jesus feeds them. So many times it's around a meal that Jesus becomes a real person to them, really there and active. My understanding of this in recent years of reading it is that it's not simply about being the starboard side of the boat, as one translation says. It's also about doing what Jesus said versus what they wanted to do. Jesus had already directed them, I'll go before you to Galilee, there you will see me, and he's already breathed on them the Holy Spirit, and he's already said, go forth and make disciples, and yet Peter is going fishing. It wasn't a godly commanded fishing trip. Jesus didn't get a word from God that said go fishing. He was doing what he wanted to do. And for so many ways, and in so many ways, the church and us as Christians, we do that too. We do what we want to do, and we look for godly results. Jesus comes along and says, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Maybe he meant direction. Maybe he meant on the way I'm telling you. Whatever it is, when we follow Jesus' commands, the, the fish nets are full. And so I think so many times that we need to look at this and what is our real agenda as people of the way 
as it's described here, which is what the people of Qumran called the Christian movement, the way. What is the, the task of the people of the way? I uh, had the opportunity this morning, it was on Channel 2 last night, and I didn't get to watch it, but as some of you know, because I've talked about it before, I'm infatuated with the Houston Zoo. In its current state, uh, it was the, our zoo was formed in 1922, it was 100 years ago. Uh, nobody here was there. But it was interesting, they had one animal at the zoo, it was a bison, and he was in a fence, and people went to the Houston Zoo to see the bison. I guess it was a unique experience in Houston to see a buffalo. Over the years, they got some more animals, and you know, those of us that grew up in Houston, the zoo used to be all the cats were in one area, and all the snakes were in another area, and all the monkeys were in another area. They don't use those words anymore. Now they do call them cats still, but now it's vertebrates talking about the monkeys, and, and, and they're all living in a natural habitat. And since the zoo was privatized in 2020, uh, is that right? 1990 maybe. Anyway, whenever it was privatized, it has changed dramatically. And they're not just a mission for us to go look at animals, but it's a mission to save a lot of things. They're working right now on South America, the, what they call the Pantanal. And so they're, they're raising awareness for us to understand. They have reinstituted the Houston frog, or the Houston toad. I'm sorry, it's not a frog. Uh, we all know what Houston toads are, right? We grew up with them. They were around everywhere, but they've almost become extinct, and so they're re-implanting them into the city. If you're not from Houston, you may not know what a Houston toad is, but it's a little toad. <laughs> My dogs love to get them. It makes them froth at the mouth. <laughs> and uh, anyway, as you go into the zoo now, they have a big sign as you walk into the entrance, and it says, see them, save them. I think that's a great mantra. It's the one we need at the church. See them, save them. Because you see, we don't need to see each other, but if we can get the light of Christ a little bit more into us, if we can be more like the disciples looking out there to the shore, if we can see Jesus in the world, then we can see the people that don't, and we can potentially be a part of their salvation. But seeing them is the problem. It's hard for us to see things that are different, that are from a different culture or a different place. I remember when I was uh, taking my preaching class, I was preaching on the, uh, the, the scripture that, about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, just briefly, the story is that the, the, the Lazarus is a, uh, basically a homeless guy that lives outside the rich man's door. And the rich man apparently goes out once in a while and tosses him a coin because people are watching and he wants to see that he's helpful. But he doesn't care about him. He doesn't even know his name. And then they both die. And so in this place of death, the, the, the Lazarus is in the arms of Abraham, which is the closest thing the Jews would understand to heaven. He's being held by Father Abraham. And the rich man is in another place and there's apparently a great chasm between them. And so he, 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 the, the rich man who didn't know his name before now looks out across the chasm and says, Lazarus, bring me some water. It's a little hot over here. And Abraham responds and says, you know, you can't get there from here. And he said, well, in that case, send people back to talk to those that are still living so they'll understand. And Abraham says, we could send people back and they won't believe. The rich man never saw Lazarus for who he was when he could do something for Lazarus. He only saw Lazarus when he thought he could help him. And I think we need to look at that. It's particularly difficult when we are uh, people, you know, of privilege, I guess you will. There's not a one of us that won't know where we're going to eat lunch today or, or where we're going to, you know, sleep tonight. We're, we're not sleeping under a tent under the Interstate 45. Uh, we know where we're going and where we're going to be the rest of the day. I would say that's privilege compared to 90% of the rest of the world. But if we don't see them, we can't save them. And so I think that's why Jesus makes this story around fish. They were in the same water, in the same place, doing it their way, and they caught nothing. And suddenly they start listening to Jesus, and the same water in the same place fills their net with fish. So that's the first part of that, fish. And then Jesus talks to Peter, and he says, love them. 
He tells them three ways to love them. He wants them to feed them and tend them and then shepherd them. Feed the sheep. Take care of them. So our task in life is to, is to find out where they are and to tend them. But let me tell you, shepherds lived in a nasty kind of environment. If you haven't been around sheep, they don't really smell good. And the people that tend them tend to smell like the sheep. And I don't have sheep. We did have a sheep or two, but I, I understand what that's like because when I come home from feeding the cows, I smell a bit like the cows. When I went out to the feedlot to take my cows for sale a few weeks ago, the feedlot had a particular, or not the feedlot, the sale barn had a particular odor. We like doing the work that Jesus asked us to do until it requires us to get dirty or to become infected with the world. We need to make disciples and we need to realize that sometimes people visit our church that aren't disciples, but for the most part, our work isn't done in here. It's done out there. It's done in the places we go and the people we see. We are living, we live, but COVID really caused it, but maybe we were already there. We live in a secluded society. I mean, most of us buy gas, right? We buy gas for our vehicle or diesel for our trucks, whatever we have. We buy fuel. How many of us even go inside anymore? We just put a little car in the machine, buy some gas. We don't talk to the person. We have no idea who's running the store. We don't know who they are, where they're from. And really, do we care? Yet what we're told is to go into the world and make disciples, and that requires relationship. It requires talking to people. It requires the things that, Peter's, that uh, Peter is told here. It requires, if you love Jesus, then you feed my sheep, you tend my sheep. We take care of others. We look after others. We see outside of ourselves. And then, of course, Jesus concludes his message to him by saying, follow me. We all want to be Jesus followers unless it involves crucifixion. We want to be Jesus followers unless it includes martyrdom. We want to be Jesus followers as long as we can keep our hands clean and do the stuff that we want to do. So when I put all these together, I get the message out of this. Well, we need to go fishing. There's no question about that. But we need to know that we don't need to look for the fish. The fish are right underneath us. We just need to fish to the right side of the boat. Many years ago now, in 2008, when I first came to this church, I got a call from one of the previous pastors. He had received an email from me about something going on at the church I'd asked him about. And he said, where are you? I said, I'm standing in the front porch. I was right out here by the bell tower. We have a bell tower. AJ. Uh, and I was standing right out there by the bell tower and, and he said well your email said you were in the mission field I said yeah I'm here at the church the church is in the mission field he said oh no he said I thought that meant you were in Africa or China or, or somewhere and I said no the mission field we need to reach is, there's no question there need to be missionaries in China and other places but the mission field we need to reach is the mission field that's right here and he said, I never thought of that. And, and I get that. And, and, and over the years of being a preacher, we've sent people on mission trips. We went, Kathy and I went on one to Costa Rica. And we, we, we've gone on these mission trips. And, and we wonder why we need to go to Africa or to even to Costa Rica when there's so much to be done right here. I mean, you think about it. There are people that need wheelchair ramps. There are people that need help with their light bill. There are people that need maintenance done on their house. There's so much that needs to be done here. Why do we need to go there? And the main reason the church sends missionaries to people like that is to open our eyes so that we, like Paul, can have those scales removed from our eyes and see the reality of the pain and suffering of God's kingdom in our neighborhood. Amen. It's hard to see. It's hard to open your eyes to see stuff. So on the way to Dallas, when I was practicing my sermon, I was riding with a guy named Paul Bruder, who was a Lutheran going to the Methodist Seminary. And we're riding along together. And, and so he preached his sermon to me, and I preached mine to him. Both sermons are about 20 minutes. It's a four and a half hour drive, so we got to do it a few times. We pulled off the North Central Expressway onto Mockingbird Lane, right where SMU is. To, to the left of, oh, of Central Express, North Central Expressway is Highland Park. You may have heard of it. It's a fairly affluent neighborhood. Uh, it's the neighborhood where Highland Park Methodist Church is, the place where George W. Bush goes to church. It's a big fancy church. And, uh, 
And we, where there's a, there used to be, it's not there anymore, there used to be a 7-Eleven right on the corner. And there was a guy there in a wheelchair, there was a, a veteran, he didn't have any legs, he's trying to cross the street. He can't cross the street because the traffic is like this, back and forth, back and forth. And I said, Paul, there's Lazarus right over there, standing right over there by the road. Stop your car. Let's block the traffic so he can cross the street. I would have never seen it had I not been deeply involved in the scripture that told me to be on the lookout for somebody that's invisible. And one of the reasons I think we come to this place is to have our eyes open to what God is trying to do, what God wants to do. I frankly am good at picking out which side of the boat I want to fish on, and i got to tell you, I have not caught very many fish. What I do know is that I have a friend, his name is Terry White, up in Somerville. He's got a boat, and he lives near the lake. And I said, I've got a boat, and I'm getting it fixed up, and I want to go some places to fish. He said, what you need is somebody like me to tell you where to fish. Because otherwise, you're not going to catch any fish. And I knew that was true because I have a previous friend that was a pastor at the Baptist Church in Somerville. His name was Jimmy Van Dorn. He had, I met him when he was living in Hardin, Texas, was a preacher over there. And when my cousin died, we needed a Baptist preacher to do my Baptist cousin's service at the cemetery there in Somerville. We called the preacher at the Somerville Baptist Church. And it was my friend Jimmy. And I said, Jimmy, I, we're standing at the cemetery. I'll never forget this. I said, I've got a question, dude. The Methodist Church has been the same my whole life. And you guys are over there on a different corner building a big family life center and your parking lot's big and your parking lot's full. What are you doing different? He said, well, I go fishing a lot. I said, you, oh, huh? I said, I know the scripture says fish. But no, he said, I get in a boat and I go out fishing and I come in with lots of fish. And people say, Brother Van Dorn, where did you catch those fish? He said, I'll show you. And they go fishing with me and we spend time out in the boat catching fish. And after a while, they get to know me and they say, well, I'm going to try the church out. And when I was talking to this friend, Terry White, he said, that preacher is legendary in this community because he didn't spend time in the office. He spent time fishing and showing people how to fish. Now, you may not be a fisherman, or you may be a fisherman and not a catch person. That's kind of what I am. But the reality is there are people that can help us. There are people you can reach that I can't. There are people out there in the world that need to know who Jesus is. And, and we've been instructed here into the same thing that Peter was told. He denied Christ three times, and three times Jesus says, you've got to love people like you love me. And if you want to prove you love them, then you tend them, you feed them, you shepherd them, you take care of them. Many years ago now, we were on the pumpkin patch with the kids coming from Golden Acres Methodist no, Elementary, and uh, we met Michelle Blank. She was just one of the aides at the school. It wasn't long after we met her. We didn't. Let me tell you, the pumpkin patch. We have no theological discussions. We talk about pumpkins, little white ones, one for four dollars, two for ten, three for twenty. Right, John? We, we we just are out there tending the sheep. Being friendly, talking to people. It's one of the most valuable things we've done in the years, and our failure to do it for the last two years has really impacted who we see in the community in a great way. Well, Michelle started coming to church here, and then Christ Methodist Church over there on uh, Howard Drive closed, and, and guess what? We ended up with several other people. Michelle, didn't, she, she would not consider herself an evangelist. I would say that even were she here. And she'll probably be watching this in a little while. But because of her engagement with the people, she then encouraged some other people. And God blessed us with Buddy Dartman and Sue and Linda, Jerry and Margie and Marilyn. And we were, what a blessing it's been. And, and, and it's never a good thing when, a, when a, a, a church has to close. Of course, the conference doesn't close churches. Churches close themselves. 
because they quit growing and they don't can't afford to pay and they can't do the stuff. And, and merging churches really never works. So, you know, there was a movement for that a few years ago. They said, well, we're going to, we're going to, there's five Methodist churches in Pasadena. We don't need five. Well, that might be true. But we do need five because there's five different communities of different kind of people that do different stuff in church. And when you merge them together, what happens is the identity of one becomes lost and over just a year or two or three, they're gone. You say, where do you get this idea? Well, let me tell you. Epworth and Parker, Methodist Church up on 225, I mean on 45, they merged. They're gone. Mergers don't fix anything. Our task is to take care of who we are and to reach out and make disciples in the community where we reside. If y'all wanted to be at First Methodist, which used to be First Methodist Church over on Fairmont, the big church with a lot of people, you'd be there. But you're here. And that's the way it's going to continue to be all the time. There's a need for different, diverse groups of people doing different things. We don't all fish the same way. We don't all use the same bait. And we don't catch the same fish. I'm always blessed to be a, a part of this church because this is a church full of working people or some retired, but just plain old people. We don't, we don't have that doctor or that lawyer that are in the background mandating what we should do. We have regular folk that know what it means to do regular stuff. And so guess who our primary target ought to be? Regular folk. I'm convinced. We live in a community, just pick a number, but there's 100,000 people within a few minutes of this church. 100,000 people. And there's probably 50 churches and probably all, well, 48 of them probably aren't very full this morning. What I can tell you is we don't need to go to Africa and we don't need to go to West Houston. We just need to go out into our community and be the people of God because there's enough people in that 100,000 people to fill every one of those 50 churches absolutely to the gills. There's plenty of Plenty of fishing to do. The question is, do we fish on the right side of the boat? And if COVID hasn't taught us anything else, things are different now. They're not worse. They're not better. They're different. I think I told some of y'all, we went uh, on our motorcycle trip. Besides the mishap on my water pump, we, we got to the end of the day and, and uh, we were trying to decide where we were going to go eat. And, and we tried something we'd never done before. We did Uber Eats. And so we dialed up on the Uber website and we saw all these restaurants. We sat there and talked about it. Yeah, catfish sounds pretty good. It comes with coleslaw and fries. Uh, they'll bring it right here in just a few minutes. And, uh, and when they brought it, sure enough, it was still hot. It didn't need to be warmed up and it was cared for. That's a different world. It probably wouldn't have existed with any success at all without COVID. Now, I'm not suggesting that we isolate ourselves and just order food at home, but I'm saying there's some things about today that aren't that bad. But I think it has become very impersonal. And I think what we have to do is bring the relationships back into what we do. Yeah, I'm going to encourage you once in a while, push the button on the gas pump, say, I'll pay inside. You never know, you might meet somebody in there you like. You never know, you might see somebody standing at the counter that needs a friend. We don't make the effort. We just do it the way we do it, the way we want to do it, when we want to do it. In so many ways, we're like the disciples and we're like Peter. Well, I'm just going to go fishing. And when we involve God in our decisions and we start to follow God in the direction we go, I'm telling you, life changes. For so many years, when, when things would go bad for me, I would know that there was a God. I, 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 even when I was, before I became a recovering, al recovering alcoholic, I knew God was there. I knew about Jesus. I never didn't believe in Jesus. But my problems were so full in front of Jesus, it was like looking at Jesus through a picket fence. I could see him over there, but I could also see the dark fence boards in the way. And they weren't all straight. They were crooked. What I found out is when I moved Jesus to the front and I started to see my problems through God, my problems looked entirely different. My life changed. My attitudes changed. My attitude toward other people. I have spent at least 20 years trying to see people that I used to think were in, it, used to not see at all. I try to make to understand what why people are different and what it is about them. And what I got to tell you is when you sit down with them and you say, "Well, where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school?" 
And, and, and what was school like for you? And, 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 and what did y'all eat for Thanksgiving dinner? Because let me tell you, different cultures, they may celebrate Thanksgiving, but they may, they may not eat the same food. And, and so we, when we start to learn who people are, we find out something that is just was amazing the day I found it out, is we're way more alike than we are different. We, we all have issues. We're, next week, we're going to celebrate Mother's Day. You know, my mother was an absolutely incredible second grade school teacher. She was a good cook when she could focus on it. And she was a pretty good housekeeper. But she was a school teacher. That's what she was. And, and so that I can love her for that because she gave her life to hundreds of children that she changed their lives over the years. Sometimes you just don't know. So let me tell you this story. I told it in Sunday school, so I'm sorry if you get to hear it again, but it's a good story. So the vet out at the uh, zoo, the main vet, he's been there for, I don't know, a long time. They got a lot of employees, been with them 40 years. <coughs> so 20 years ago, they sent him and some other people down to Mexico to harvest sea turtle eggs. And so they harvest about thousands of these eggs back to Houston. They hatched them out. And they took them down to Galveston and they released the sea turtles. Well, this last year or a year or so ago, they found a turtle that had been injured, probably hit by a prop on a boat or something, but most of its shell was, a lot of its shell was destroyed. And so they brought it back to the zoo and they harvested several hundred eggs from that sea turtle. And then miraculously, in the care of the people at the zoo, the turtle improved. And, and nature took course and Healing took place over the wound. And you know, that turtle eventually was good enough they could release it again. And when he did that, he noticed there was a little white dot on the shell. And that little white dot on the shell was an indicator that it was one of the original eggs that they had hatched out that came from Mexico when they had released 20 years before. Now, it's a miracle that he got to see the beginning and the end of that story. But I want to tell you, friends, you don't know what impact you're making on the kingdom today, and you may never know, but you're making an impact. And my prayer is that we continue to make that impact so that the next generation and the next generation and the next generation have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Jesus does the saving, but we're called to do the loving. And we're called to do that loving in all kinds of ways. Tending, feeding, providing for. Even our Mother's Day offering where we give money to the nursing homes so the people whose money runs out have a place to stay. Uncle, that wonderful thing that's right now providing lots of services in Ukraine, we're doing it from right here because we participate in that. Texas Annual Conference for Methodist Hospital years ago, no idea that it would become what it is now one of the main medical resource centers in the nation. And then I guess I'm particularly proud of SMU. It's very different than it used to be. It is Southern Methodist University, but let me tell you, there's a lot of not churchy stuff going on at the university, but we have people being trained to be in business, to architects, to being trained to be lawyers and preachers. My goal as a preacher is not to have a big mug up here and pour it into your little cup telling you I got all the answers. I do not have all the answers. But I think the answer for me is so clear that like Peter, Jesus is just asking me to do a simple thing. And that's to love people. And I want to encourage you to think a little bit about that simple phrase, see them, save them. Because if we don't see them, we're never going to be a part of saving them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you're able, would you please stand? Take this opportunity to welcome each other to the house of the Lord and to offer signs of peace and reconciliation. Well, I know that
Not real. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son and to inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ to call us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave his life up for us, he, gave, he took bread. He gave thanks to you and he broke the bread, giving it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit in your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And with the, the boldness of the children of God, let us repeat together the prayer that Jesus taught us, which says, Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As is our new tradition, when you come forward for communion, if you'll just hold your hands out, I will dip the bread for you. My hands have been sanitized, and we will uh, share in the Lord's table. You're always welcome to pray here at the rails, at the altar rails if you want, or certainly in your seats is fine. Friends, the table is prepared. Uh, I don't think we need an order. Just come as you will. <clears throat> Scripture today has everyone been fed? Friends, we've been to the table where God calls us. It's a difficult job, but He calls us because He knows we can do it. Remember that great song, Are Ye Able? said the Master. We're able. Let's go forth into the kingdom 
and be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ so that when we see them, we can say them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen. Oh, we're going to sing. <laughs> we're going to sing. We could just leave, but let's sing. Jesus, keep me near the cross. That will help us remember. <laughs>